Amen. 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 I got it. All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Now, before we begin, I do have two special announcements. I tell you what, let's make it three because, hey, the Schmitz are here. Hey, Cecilia. Hey, everyone. You can stay as long as you want, okay? <laughs> so happy you guys are here. Um, uh, let's see. I want to start off by giving an announcement, uh, and, and I want to give everyone ample notice, okay? On January the 7th of 2003. Well, maybe I was talking in past tense. Who knows? <clears throat> in 2023, at 1030 AM, we will be having a church-wide meeting in this room. OK? Oh, thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, in, in this meeting, we're going to be detailing our plans for 2023 and how we're going to be moving forward. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not crazy about the direction that our culture is taking these days. How about you? Yeah? So I ask, what is the one thing that can possibly change the direction of American culture to this day? It's the gospel. It's the gospel that's going to do it, the light of Jesus. And I believe that God has a big plan for Williamsburg and for all of Hampton Roads. And I would love for everyone to be there so that we can have a serious discussion about the Great Commission and what I believe God's desire for our church literally will be for years to come. So write it down. Get out your phone. Get out your calendar. Get everything. January, Saturday, January 7th, 2023, 10.30 a.m. in this room. You have an entire month to make appropriate plans so you can attend this important meeting. Sounds good? No excuses. Okay. Our next announcement is going to be given by the wonderful Candy Farino. Let's hear it for Candy, everyone. Oh, and, and Bobby comes with her, too. So, yes. Yes. All right. All right. All right. I'm going to give it. No, I'm giving the mic to Candy. Okay. Here we go. Yes. Thank you. Yes. We're a team. We all are a team, right? You start. Okay. Well, for some of you all that may not be real familiar, if you came more recent, uh, about eight years ago, Candy wanted to cook a meal for a police department in the city, and. And it turned out that uh, eight years later, we're, make, we're doing a banquet for seven, no, for six or five, five, <laughs> five police departments. And I'm saying seven because the added to that was all of the firemen and all of the judges and everybody in the city that has anything to do with the police department. So it's been about, um, it's been an incredible blessing because it started out where we wanted to encourage them because of all the flack they've been taking for the last eight years, especially back then when they wanted to defunct them and all that. But this, uh, this year, it seems like um, they have gone from a project to encourage them to really family. And if, for some of you all that have been to the meetings and to some of the luncheons, you know it's, it's like a, it, we get to do worship, we can, and we're asked to pray over all of them before we do anything else and eat. So it's, a, it's really almost, I have to pinch myself to think, God, we're really doing this, and they love it, and they're looking forward to it more than anything. So if you want to be a part of it, uh, we can have you make sides for cooking if you want to do that. Uh, some of you can help me go pick all the food up for each day. It starts... Uh, next week, um, well, this coming week, it'll be starting on Thursday and Friday. Those are the two biggest ones that we do, York County and James City County. But anyway, Candy will give you details, but I'll just say be praying for this because I've even felt that it's gotten to be such a close relationship that I might just say something other about Christmas other than food. And, um, and there's about probably 30 restaurants that help us every year. So it's really incredible how they've stepped up and make the best for the police departments. So this year, I, I've actually thought about uh, contacting one of them to see if I could just share a short little, I wish you all could be in heaven with me more than I do anything else. 
And so that we, I probably won't give a, you know, invitation to get saved, but you never know, you know. But uh, anyway, do be praying for that. Uh, on There's five of them that we'll be doing in the next week or so, all right? Okay, um, so all the men or women that are able to possibly pick up things at restaurants, we, can you see Bobby? Because he will give you the schedule and see if it works out for you to help in that capacity. Now, there is a clipboard which is missing. Um, yeah. It went missing. So if you happen to see one by your seat and it says police, that's the one I'm going to be passing around. But <clears throat> it's um, for, five, like he said, five departments, James City County, York County, the um, state police. And now the, we knew this is our second year for doing the courthouse sheriff's department. Um, and like he said, judges and, and bailiffs and all of those that um, work in that capacity in uniform as well and then the city of Williamsburg. <clears throat> so um, I have the, as it goes around, you'll see the dates and you'll see what the item is. And if you could just, whatever fits your schedule, if you could sign your name and your cell number, because I'll call you and remind you. Um, I know this is a very busy time, so um, I just appreciate any, any help. Uh, you know, many hands li make light work. So we claim that scripture over this. and. Um, it's been such a blessing for those that help as, as much as for those that have received. So thank you so much. It comes from Living Hope. The letterhead says Living Hope Church and is handed out to all the restaurants and all the businesses. We have a school on board that is doing uh, food for it as well. Um, and just tons of citizens, just random citizens. So thank you you living hope for your heart to do this because it is such a blessing and it's expanded to over 500 police officers now so what started out as 15 it's now 500 so thank you so much for all these years thanks candy thanks bobby that's great one final announcement um most of you will probably know uh, kevin ross who has been uh, uh he has served at our church so many times he lives in north carolina and serves regularly in our kids' ministry. Um, he shared with a few of us this past week that they, um, uh, their truck broke down. Is that what it was, Maurice? Yeah, they, they've just kind of suffered uh, just a financial hardship, and uh, we wanted to make it available for anyone that wants to donate to Ross Family Ministries. Um, if you wanted to write a check for them, uh, you could leave it in our offering box in the back. Sound good? All right, wonderful. Well, let's, uh, let's get down to business. What do you say? Yeah? Oh, Maurice, go ahead. That's dangerous. They'll give it to anyone at that point. Okay. <laughs> yes. Amen. 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 You'll be giving us something great. Thank you, Maurice. All right. Let's, uh, let's have a sermon now. Sound good? All right. Well, I want to start by telling you how much I enjoyed the last two weeks with uh, both Matt Brummett and Pastor Philip Botts, their sermons as they kicked off our Christmas series this year. Uh, the title of this series, in case you didn't know, it's called It's All Been Done Before, and it's part three, just, uh, so, just so you know. Uh, Matt started off two weeks ago and talked about the role that Joseph played in the birth of Jesus and how God entrusted Joseph with a child that didn't belong to him. But it wasn't the first time that this had happened, as Matt showed us in the book of Hosea. And then last week, Pastor Philip talked about the young girl named Mary, who was told by an angel that she would conceive and bear a child, quite similar to a young girl uh, named Hagar, centuries before. And it's incredible to see the parallels throughout Scripture and how there's little originality in many stories. But that doesn't discredit them. What it does is it shows that our God likes to work in certain ways, through certain people. And today, in that same vein, I want to talk about a person. And he wasn't even at the birth of Jesus. But he was still very, very important. He's a person that many people, they actually thought he was Jesus at first. And he was quick to correct 
that assertion whenever it was made. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. And Luke is uh, such a great resource for the story of Jesus because he took so much time to interview people and ask questions about him. You know, I can only imagine what it was like when Luke sat down with Mary and Peter and so many others and said, just tell me about Jesus. Tell me, tell me everything there is to know about him and to be a fly on the wall for one of those conversations. What a gift that would have been. And I think about when you ask a woman about the birth of her child, she tends to know many details, wouldn't you say? She tends to know all the details. She tends to know many more details than her husband does. She remembers it as a great day. And my wife is, is no exception. Jessica will start with how and when we found out that she was pregnant. She'll go through the whole pregnancy. She could tell you every doctor's name. She can tell you about the hospital room. She can tell you about the police officer that pulled me over on our way to the hospital when we were about to have Gino. She knows it all. And the story of Mary. It actually doesn't even start with Mary. It starts with her cousin, Elizabeth, and her husband, a man by the name of Zechariah. And as, as we read this passage, I'm going to set the scene because these, these were not easy times for our ancestors, our spiritual ancestors. Join me in verse 5. Let there be light. Luke 1, verse 5, where it says, In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, starting out, we know that since these are the days of Herod, it was not an easy time to be a Jew and live under a man like Herod. Herod, he wasn't a Jew himself. He thought he was, but he wasn't. He wasn't by blood, and he certainly wasn't by faith. He even executed many people, including members of his own family. He was a cruel, terrible man. But let's get back to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Verse 6, both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commands and requirements of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive. And both of them were well along in years. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it was likely not an easy life for this couple to not have a child, to not have someone inherit your name and everything else that comes with it. Have you ever met a couple that could not conceive? I know I have. And they want nothing more in this world than to have a child. And year after year of trying and praying and through the pain and anguish, asking God, what has happened? And when they reach a certain age, they just lose hope. And they believe that, that maybe it's time to focus on other things. And it's sad. And I believe that Zachariah and Elizabeth had reached this point. I'll just focus on my job as a priest now. And you know, this wasn't the first time in the Bible that a story like this has happened, is it? There have been other women that couldn't conceive. You know, last week, Pastor Philip talked about Abram and his wife, Sarai, who could not conceive. And of course, we know the story when the angel of the Lord appeared and, and said, she's going to conceive him. And what's the first thing they do? They laugh. They, if I were to ask women in this room, I'm not going to ask who the oldest woman in this room is, but imagine who she is. If I were to say, hey, you're going to have a baby this time next year, you're laughing. You're laughing right now. And, of course, Isaac means laughter, and that's the baby that they had. And Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, had the same problem, and yet they still had twin boys. And then we have his son, Jacob, and his wife, Rachel, who could also not conceive, yet she still managed to have two sons. And somehow God made a way for all these women to do the impossible. And now this next part of the story needs a little bit of context as well. Because the duties of the priests were so sacred, he would go into the temple 
once a year for the priestly duties. And only priests from a particular lineage would be chosen to do this. And Moses gave those directions for the descendants of his brother Aaron. And you know, if there's, let's say, five priests hanging around, it'll probably be just a matter of time before it's your turn to go into the temple, right? But by the time that Zechariah was serving, several hundred years have passed. And the descendants of Aaron had multiplied quite a bit. And now there's around 20,000 priests. Chances are, if the lot ever fell to you, and you were chosen to go into that temple, it was the only time in your life that you were chosen. And it was such a big deal that we could argue that this could be one of the most important moments of a priest's life, to go into that temple. Join me in verse 8. I'm going to read this next verse with special emphasis, with all this in mind. When, it hap- when, when his division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, It happened, and he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. At the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. And I can only imagine what's going through Zachariah's head at this time. Does this happen every time? He's never been in there before. Verse 12, when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. All of a sudden... All of Zechariah's dreams have come true. And he just found out he's going to be a father. Does he jump for joy and say, oh, praise God, I believe every word you say? No. No. And this angel gave him the name of the baby that's going to be born. You know, I mean, I'm not going to ask, but if an angel had ever appeared to you, would you tend to believe what he's going to say? You know, I would hope Zechariah would have no problem believing this prophecy. Verse 18, how can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel, for I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. You know, like I say, he's old. They have prayed the prayers. They've been through this for many years. Please, no more heartbreak. And I love this response from Gabriel. I absolutely love it. Because Zechariah, he said, I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Verse 19, then the angel answered him, well, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Take that old man. You're an old man. Well, I'm Gabriel. Don't argue with me about this. Now listen, you will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. How's that for trying to argue with what God has set in motion? Can't argue anymore. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he stayed so long in the sanctuary. When he did not, he could not speak to them. Then they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his ministry were complete, He went back home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Chances are you, you know how this story goes, right? Right. We know that Elizabeth gives birth to a beautiful baby boy. 
And when the time comes to name him, she says, ah, let's name him John. Uh, The relatives come in and say, well, you don't have any relatives named John. You know, so they ask Zechariah, who confirms that the baby's name will be John. And at that moment, he regains his ability to speak. And, and, the, and the people ask themselves, it says in Scripture, they ask themselves, what will this baby become? And immediately, Zechariah begins to prophesy about this baby. 400 years of silence from the Lord has been happening, and now we are once again hearing from him. And you know what's amazing is that 400 years before was, was when the last book of the Old Testament was written. A great book, what's it called? Malachi. Turn there with me. Malachi, uh, the end of it, chapter 4. And, and just for the record, I love this, a trick question. Who wrote Malachi. We, we, we don't know. Malachi actually is not a proper name in Hebrew. Do you know that? It, it, it actually means my messenger. And it has since become a name in Hebrew. So if you meet someone named Malachi, don't say, well, your name's not really a name. It is now, but at the time it wasn't. It just means my messenger. 400 years. That's a long time. You know, 400 years ago, it was 1622. King James was on the throne of England and Scotland and had only recently commissioned the King James Bible. The only two colonies in North America that the English had were Jamestown and Plymouth. Can we agree that a lot can happen in 400 years? I'd say so. But the last thing that God told his people, you know, it's almost exactly the same thing that Gabriel tells our friend Zechariah. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, Remember the instructions of Moses, my servant, the statutes and ordinances I commanded him at Horeb, For all Israel. Look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, I'm just going to talk about the elephant in the room. Could you imagine if the Bible ended that way? That we're going to strike the land with a curse? Because that's how the Jews' Bible ends. And that's not very comfortable. I'm I'm glad ours doesn't. Uh, Jewish scribes and scholars, they read verse 5 over again to make themselves feel better when they do the readings, just so you know. But regardless, both Gabriel's message in Luke and Malachi's message to the people, they both say something kind of strange. Luke says, and he will go before you in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous, to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. And Malachi says, look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers and their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And it's very interesting. It's a prophecy about a prophecy. And I I, I don't believe that Zechariah was a fool. I really don't. To be a priest, he had to have been educated and know the scriptures well. And for Gabriel to quote Malachi like this, I have to believe it got Zechariah's attention. He knew exactly what he was talking about. And I don't know about you, but when an angel tells me something, I'd like to think that I would believe it. No problem. But Zechariah is a special case. And, and, and what is Zachariah's problem here? You know, and I, I think it's the same as so many others. It's, it's are, are you sure you have the right guy, Lord? Are, are you sure it's me? You couldn't be, possibly be talking to me. What a terrible excuse. Terrible. And, and he, he was, God was talking to him. God delights in using people like Zachariah and Elizabeth and you and me for his wonderful purpose. Because when he does, we can't take credit. And it's a wonderful system that gives him proper glory. But I want, I want to get back to Elijah. You know, he, he is such a mystery to so many people. There are so many great, great stories about Elijah in the Bible. You know, lightning coming down from heaven, fiery chariots, all kinds of just amazing things that Elijah does. He came at a time of spiritual darkness. 
He ate food provided by God. He called the people back to God. He confronted idolatry. An evil king wanted him dead. He lived in the wilderness. He was a man of prayer. He ministered at the Jordan River. He spoke to a remnant of people whom he knew would believe. He wore animal skin clothing and a leather girdle, and he was a prophet for the true God. And every little bit of description that I just read about our friend Elijah can also be applied to John the Baptist. Every last one of them. Elijah ministered all around the kingdom of God. He had an effective ministry. And when it was all over, God decided that it was time for Elijah to come home. He did, not, he did it in a manner so spectacular as he took him up to heaven in a fiery chariot. It's fun. There, there, there are some mysterious ways that people get to heaven in the Bible. Enoch is one of them, Moses is another, and Elijah is the third. And it's so, it's funny how many people got Elijah confused with the coming of the Messiah after this happened. People were literally waiting for the return of Elijah just as we wait for the return of Christ. And, and I'm glad that Elijah's not the one we're relying on. He didn't die for my sins, did he? He certainly didn't die for yours. In fact, throughout both of their lives, both John the Baptist and Jesus were asked multiple times if they were Elijah himself. And maybe, maybe Elijah had been reincarnated as one of these men. Put another term on it. Well, I'm here to say nothing could be further from the truth. You know, reincarnation, it's the belief that when we die, we can be born again as another living being, like a blade of grass or an eel or, or something else. And, and you keep dying indefinitely until you reach another status, sometimes a godlike status. It's also a heinous belief that the death of Jesus wasn't sufficient, and we're the ones that have to keep dying in order to achieve that perfection. It's heinous. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad it only took one death to get me into the kingdom of God. And I don't have to keep dying. Do you imagine dying over and over and over again? And I really would not like to think about it. And it's an insult to my Messiah. But I, but I digress. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Because scripture makes it clear that someone, not Elijah, would be coming. And he would be a forerunner to Christ. We would usher in his presence. His birth would be a sign that the Messiah is coming. And Isaiah, a great man of God, a giant in the faith, is no exception. And, and Isaiah is such a wonderful book. <clears throat> and, but I have to acknowledge something that I, that I always found so neat about this book. How many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? 66. Who said that? It was Randy? Good job, Randy. Well, Randy's a pastor. Randy has to know that. <laughs> 66 chapters are in the book of Isaiah. How many books of the Bible are there? Congratulations. Okay. More, more people than Randy knew that. Okay. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah, they're all about judgment, righteous judgment of God, and they tend to be kind of a downer when you read them. How many books of the Old Testament are there? 39. And what are they about? All kinds of things, but righteous judgment, things like that. Yes, it's about Jesus too, Dan. Thank you very much. Yes. The next 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah, they're about salvation and grace and good news and hope. It's almost like the Bible kind of slimmed down in one book. And by the way, how many books are in the New Testament? 27. 27. None of the books of the Bible were written with chapters and verses in mind. Um, it, it was in the 1550s that they started adding chapters. We're, we're less than 500 years, chapters and verses have been in the Bible. But this is one of the few places in the Bible where they're in the right place. It's pretty cool. Lamentations is the other place, by the way. All right. And it just so happens that when we read, what we read in Isaiah chapter 40, it marks the very beginning of the good news that Isaiah brings. The 39 chapters of righteous judgment are over. And now we're in chapter 40. Praise God. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, where it says, A voice of one crying out, Prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. 
Make a straight highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough place is a plain. And the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, not many of Jesus' followers and friends have prophecies specifically about them. And the only two that I can think of uh, right off the top of my head are James and John the Baptist. Specific prophecies about them in the Old Testament. And this very specific word of the Lord is telling us to listen to the voice crying out. Listen to the man wearing the camel skins. Listen to the guy who may seem a little different and crazy. Discern his words. You can trust him. He's going to, he's going to do great things, but don't be fooled by what others say about him. It's the ultimate lesson in listening to what God says and not man. You know why? It's because when man wants something to happen, they let their own agenda get in the way of truth. Don't believe me? Get on the internet for five minutes. That is why our God found it necessary to silence Zechariah. Zechariah just had to be right. He knew that his wife would never conceive. This whole business of ladies over a certain age having children, it's long over. Happened before for Sarai, but not my wife. Zechariah, he was going to say that to people. He was going to say, well, we'll see how that turns out. And after a long history of prophets speaking God's words and having to compete with the flavor of the month and whatever trend that man was believing that day, God decided that he was no longer interested in what man had to say. And he didn't want the people to hear it either. <clears throat> Zechariah, tell you what, let's talk about this again in a few months. Silence. You know, multiple times, man was told that there would be a forerunner to Jesus. And they were so excited about Jesus coming that they decided that John must be Jesus. Or, or even Elijah had returned. And both of those explanations seriously shortchanged Jesus. Both of those insult the mission of Jesus. They lack glory to God. And because of this, both theories must be dismissed. And if you need any further proof, you can just take John the Baptist's word for it. As he was about to baptize Jesus, what did he say? Oh, I, I tell you what, I think you should be baptizing me. Not the other way around. And Jesus assured him it was decent and it was in order for John to baptize Jesus. And I believe Elijah would have had the same reaction. Elijah, who Jesus spoke with on the mountain that day. And on that day, when Peter said to Jesus, let's build a shelter for you, Moses, and Elijah, somewhat putting them all on equal footing, Elijah and Moses, they just left because Jesus was not going to play around with that. And even while Jesus was on the cross, he said the Hebrew words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the witnesses who didn't understand, maybe they didn't speak Hebrew, they heard that Eli, Eli part. And they said, well, he must be calling out for Elijah to save him. And now that we know that he's not Elijah, he must be asking for Elijah to finally return. And how ridiculous is that? Absolutely ridiculous. Turn back to Luke chapter 1. Chris, could you come up? Luke chapter 1. Verse 76. Verse 76. Because people have been trying to replace Jesus since before he was even born. And around 3 BC, six months before the birth of Jesus, John the Baptist was born. And Zechariah, when he could speak again, like I said, the first thing he did was prophesy over his son. And he says in Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 76, And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation 
through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And one thing I love to do is every time I see the word salvation in the Bible, I like to replace it with the word Jesus. Because the word Yeshua, it means salvation. Salvation is from the Lord. He says, you're going to give people knowledge of Jesus. I love that way of looking at it. Trick question. Who was the last Old Testament prophet? It's a trick question. You don't have to answer. It it, it was John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist. His father was the second to last, Zechariah, because he prophesied these words. In the Old Testament, one way or another, you know, it lists or speaks of 63 men and women who prophesied about Jesus. Did you know that? And to say that John the Baptist and his father were among them would be very accurate. And it had been done before. It was further proof and evidence that a Messiah was on his way. And even when he walked the earth, the last Old Testament prophet was preaching about his coming. And some say he was crazy. And some say he didn't know what he was talking about. Or just trying to be manipulative. And maybe that's something you've been accused of yourself. For talking about Jesus and proclaiming his name. I know I have. Well, I'm here to say that if that has happened to you, you are in very good company. It means you're part of a holy family who worships the one true God. It means that you're a small part of a kingdom that is not found on this earth. It means that as the apple of God's eye, you belong to him now and forever. And we continue that proud legacy declaring who Jesus is. And you know something else? The best part about Jesus? And I don't say that lightly. He's coming back. He is coming back. Will you be like John and usher in the Lord and announce it and proclaim it to the nations that Jesus is coming back? And people, they might think you're a little kooky. They might think that you're a little weird. And man, who... You know, you're talking about some invisible sky God. Yes, I am. And he's awesome. And you can have a relationship with him. And he has a son named Jesus. And anything you have ever done to separate yourself from him, I don't care if your name is Adolf Hitler, he can forgive you. He can and he will. And all you have to do is believe Romans 10, 9 and confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. Because I have news for you. The world needs to hear this. They need to hear it more than ever. The world is lost, and it only gets worse every day. And I'm here to say we're on a mission. We're on a mission to carry out that legacy of men like John the Baptist. And we shouldn't try to speak against it the way someone like Zachariah does, should we? Let's let God make that decision, not us. So as we close, I'm going to say that if you, if you just need an extra bit of boldness, the way that our friend John the Baptist had, maybe you need to overcome some unbelief the way that Zechariah did. Maybe you want to do great things like Elijah did. That's all for you. So let, let's stand. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone in here. I thank you that you have placed us here and now. You have put us on this earth for this time with the mission to declare who you are to the nations so that they will know you, so that they will come to you, so that your family will get even bigger. Lord, I speak that boldness that boldness over everyone here. When there's a hard decision that has to be made that could potentially separate us from you, we know your word says that nothing can separate us. And we won't let the lies of the enemy get the better of us. God, I speak a destiny over everyone in here who may not know it. 
and we speak your voice, the clarity to hear your voice over us all. God, you are so good. You are so good. And I thank you that what we do, it's all been done before. It's all something you have been leading people for your glory. And we ask for that for ourselves right now. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, we love you guys. And if anyone does need prayer, we have some people down here that would love to pray with you. Uh, Hopefully, we'll see you at the police function this week. And if not, we'll see you uh, for our potluck next Sunday. Love you guys.